be starting in about 20 seconds. Just waiting for a few more people to filter in and then we'll get started. Good evening, everybody. And evening to Susan. Great, okay. Hello, everyone, and um, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining this year's Space Public Lecture, which is all about the geology of the mysterious planets beyond our solar system. I'm Flo Bullo, and I'm head of the policy and engagement here at the Geological Society. And this lecture is the final instalment of our Year of Space series as part of our themed year for 2021, where we've been casting our gaze upwards beyond the Earth to examine rocks, landscapes and processes on other planets. We've had a fantastic programme of public lectures, outreach activities and conferences throughout the year, many of which you can now find on our website or on our YouTube channel um, as past resources. And in particular, if you missed our free Spacescapes exhibition on Piccadilly this summer, you can still visit it from wherever you are in the world as we've made a virtual tour available on the Spacescapes website. I'll pop a link in the chat to that um, during the talk. So if you're fascinated by space and rocks and other planets, then please make sure you take a look at the exhibition. So on to the lecture today, we have the fantastic Dr. Ollie Shortle, Assistant Professor from the Institute of Astronomy and Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Cambridge here in the UK. Ollie's going to be taking us on a journey of the history and geology of planets and bodies beyond our solar system. If you have any questions for Ollie, we will be doing a Q&A session at the end of the talk. Please put your questions in the Zoom Q&A box, or if you're joining from YouTube, just pop them in the chat and we will collate them and ask at the end. Um, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Ollie to take us on this fascinating journey of planets outside of our solar system. Thank you very much, Ollie. Cool, thanks so much for the introduction, Flo. I'm really excited to be speaking to everyone this evening um, and taking, kind of ending the series of the Year on Space um, talks by looking beyond the solar system altogether to planets elsewhere in the galaxy. Um, so yeah, the theme is gonna be um, geology beyond the solar system, but we will root some of our discussion in the solar system and what we might learn from the solar system and indeed Earth itself. So we'll kind of take a tour all the way from Earth um, out through the solar system and beyond. And the sort of secret message um, of the talk is why a geology degree just got um, 52, 53 billion times more useful. So we'll come back around to that at the very end, but uh, rest assured it, it has for anyone holding a geology degree or hoping to gain one, um, it's, it's much more valuable than it was a few years ago. And I'll end by explaining why that is. Um, but I think before we kind of move beyond the solar system and think about uh, planets, planets out there in the rest of the galaxy, it's useful just to kind of ground our understanding of what diversity of rocky planet types um, we have in the solar system. And so this is, this is Earth, and in fact, a view of the fantastic exhibition that was held by the Geological Society um, early this year for the Year of Space. Um, and so Earth, as we, as we know it, is a, a planet blessed with liquid water at its surface and also dry land, um, which we obviously occupy, an atmosphere which is uh, amenable to life, nitrogen rich, um, but with plenty of oxygen um, and uh, an average surface temperature about 15 degrees C. So this is the planet we, we know, know and love and um, harbors all known life in the solar system. Um, looking beyond Earth, um, Mars. And so this is an image um, looking into Gale Crater in, in Mars, taken October, October 8th, 2015, by the Curiosity rover, looking across this spectacular desert landscape um, down into the crater um, with Mount, Mount Sharp rising on the horizon there. And so Mars, although it looks um, very pleasant um, and hospitable in this, this image, um, we know obviously it has a, a CO2 dominated atmosphere, but an atmosphere which is incredibly tenuous. Um, so it's six one thousandth the pressure of our own atmosphere um, and it has an average temperature of minus 60 degrees C. And so this is obviously a remarkable contrast to Earth, where we have liquid water, oceans, clouds and uh, abundant biosphere. And then looking inwards from Earth, um, we obviously come to Venus. Um, and there's been rather less exploration of Venus than there has of Mars, but this is um, some of the fantastic images that were returned from some of the Soviet landers um, to Mars. 
um, this image from March 5th, 1982, looking out across this um, hazy landscape um, where in the foreground um, we see these kind of platy tops of lava flows covering the surface of the planet. And now this, this lander, which soon after taking this image would um, suffer a horrible fate at the hands of this um, acidic high pressure atmosphere, so 90 times the pressure of our own atmosphere, a surface temperature of over 400 degrees um, and dominantly carbon dioxide. So the kind of three rocky planets that sit next to each other in the solar system are remarkably different to each other. And only one of which um, we have any evidence for, well, only one of which we know hosts life. And well, so there's been huge amounts of searching on Mars. We've yet to find um, definitive evidence for life on Mars. So we see in our own solar system, the sort of fragility of the conditions that give rise to habit habitability of planets, the capacity of a planet to host life. And so this is kind of really the central question um, we're kind of asking ourselves now in looking beyond the solar system um, to exoplanets and whether or not they may host life, but also looking back into Earth's own past and indeed the past of Venus and Mars as well, and asking the question, you know, when did Earth become habitable? How has it maintained its habitability over its history? So how has it maintained liquid water at its surface and kind of moderate surface temperatures? And what happened for Venus and Mars to throw them into their current states where they've suffered climate catastrophe? In the case of Mars becoming cold and in the case of, of Venus becoming extremely hot, um, both inhospitable in their own um, different ways. And so although we're, we're interested in looking far beyond Earth in sort of applying the answers to these questions, the sort of the, the chemistry and the physics that we're going to want to use to answer them is going to have to be rooted in study of Earth and those planets that we can access. And so this is just one image that really um, kind of highlights that for me. This is taken by NASA's Cassini probe looking um, looking back at the night side of Saturn. So this is the Saturn's night side here. This is its spectacular ring system. And this bright blue dot is looking back over one and a half billion kilometers towards the Earth. Um, so this just kind of emphasizes to me this really spectacular image um, from solar system exploration that sort of however far we go, um, we're always looking back to Earth to kind of calibrate our understanding of basic planetary processes. And we want to answer for Earth, and more generally, what, what made it a habitable planet? Um, what meant that Earth sustained liquid water, was given water in the first place, sustained it at its surface, and was then able to have a biosphere um, emerge on it, in contrast to Venus and, and Mars? And if we can understand this for Earth, can we use our insights um, as to how planetary habitability emerges to, say, predict um, the habitability of planets around other stars, so that when we're investing telescope time in monitoring these distant exoplanets, we know which ones to look at, to focus our attention on um, for prospects of, of discovering life. So I want to begin by thinking about Earth's own habitability and just take this incredibly quick tour through Earth history um, from some of the key events in its, in its history that are relevant for thinking about its habitability. So what we're looking at in this slide is sort of geological time. Um, so left is the beginning of beginning of time for Earth, four and a half billion years ago, um, towards the present on the right hand edge here. Um, and all these these words are just the geological division of time. Um, and then they're not super important. But what we'll look at is some of the key processes that have occurred over this this long period of time, the four and a half billion years of, of Earth's life. So the, specifically and specifically those processes relevant to habitability. So the kind of striking feature of the last couple of million years is, is glaciation, is, has been the expansion and retreat and the kind of cyclic expansion and retreat of ice sheets at, at the North Pole and at the South Pole as well. And that's just illustrated in these, um, these kind of schematics here showing the extent of ice cover on the continents 18,000 years ago before the last ice age ended. So that sequence of expansion and collapse has happened for about two million years and is really characteristic of sort of the modern, the modern Earth climate. If we want to go further back in time, we start needing to be creative in how we access information on past climates. So we 
don't have weather stations, obviously, that were, were out on Earth's surface 20 million years ago to understand how hot it was, what the weather was like, what the climate was like. So we have to start using rocks themselves to reconstruct the past climate. And a key, a key archive of climate information in rocks are fossils. Um, and this is just an image of, of brachiopods, a particularly useful marine um, organism that's been, been around for much of the last 500 million years of Earth history. And we can use information gained from studying brachiopod fossils to try and reconstruct Earth's climate over the last few hundred million years. And overwhelmingly, what these tell us is whilst there's been significant perturbations to Earth's climate in the last 500 million years, it remained relatively hospitable from kind of our perspective um, for that whole time. If we go back before 500 million years ago, then we start to see evidence for some slightly more wacky things having happened in Earth's past. One of the most dramatic is, is these so-called snowball events where the planet potentially entirely froze over or extensively froze over. And that's what's kind of shown in this, this kind of schematic here, a sort of snowball Earth event. And these are evidenced in the geological record by these remarkable rocks um, and that's what's kind of shown in the, the, the main picture here, um, which contain a whole jumble of different fragments of rocks of all different sorts, of all different sizes, kind of jumbled together and dumped. Um, and these are so-called diamictites, and they're a very characteristic rock type produced by ice sheets, and specifically when the ice sheets retreat and melt. So these start cropping up in the geological record if you go back far enough in time, and they crop up in rocks which were otherwise believed to have been deposited at low latitude, so near the equator. And that's sort of the basis for arguing that there must have been a global snowball event. So there have been massive perturbations to Earth's climate if we go back, back far enough, but life seems to have kind of weathered these climatic storms and the Earth has come out the other side and had liquid water again at the surface. If we go back kind of even further, so now looking at sort of two and a half, roughly two and a half billion years ago, um, we start to see some kind of remarkable rocks, um, which evidence a really significant change in the amount of oxygen in Earth's atmosphere. Um, and so the, the rock kind of we're looking at in this picture on the left is a, is a banded iron formation. So you see these red stripes in the rock, um, which are kind of rusty, which just look like rusting metal. And that's exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing kind of rusting rocks in kind of layers. And these are forming where iron at the surface of the earth is being oxidized as oxygen is, is kind of being pumped into the atmosphere by life. And so there's this transition, this key transition in earth history where the atmosphere actually gains its oxygen um, that we take for granted today. But if we go far enough back in time, it, it wasn't there. And it was actually a major transition where life put this oxygen into the atmosphere and the rocks record this um, dramatic event. And then finally, well, not quite finally, but going back even further, um, we now see evidence for ultra hot magmas having erupted at the Earth's surface. So beginning to see evidence that the Earth had this much hotter past, or certainly its interior had this hotter past. Um, and you get these remarkable rocks called comatiites that have this really distinctive um, kind of spiny texture. And that's what we're seeing in the, in the image here. Um, and this is evidence of really hot magmas having erupted. So we're seeing that the interior of the earth was, was different to, to the present just in terms of its heat. And then finally, we kind of reach the oldest rocks on earth. Um, and these are the so-called, uh, these are the acastonices. So looking at almost 4 billion years old. And you can see in this image, they're really highly deformed. So you can see all these kind of wrinkles in the rock. So they've had a, an extended, a huge period of time spent at Earth's surface. And in that time, they've been involved in mountain building events and folded and heated up and um, crushed and fractured again and again, leaving us with this kind of wreck of a rock today, um, but nonetheless can be dated to, to over 3 billion years old. And this really kind of forms the sort of geological event horizon. And beyond this point, we really run out of rock with which to explore the earliest part of Earth's history. So maybe the first 500 million years, um, which is possibly the critical period in which certainly the planet formed and also possibly in which life emerged on the planet. Because almost as far back as we can see in the geological record, there's evidence for life. Um, so life, Earth has spent most of its Earth, most of its history, Earth has had life uh, on the surface. 
Um, so our planet is fundamentally one which is co-evolved with, with life. So this is kind of a major challenge. As we go back and further, further back in time, we see less, we have less and less information about Earth's past. But as far back as we can go, the Earth appears to have been habitable, i.e. it's had liquid water at its surface, and it appears to have been inhabited um, and the evidence of life up to the point, more or less, where we run out of rock to ask the question. So in terms, in terms of studying the Earth, that leaves major questions very hard to answer, um, such as uh, the conditions around the advent of life, how Earth formed, the conditions on the planet during its first few hundred million years of life, and certainly even looking back into bits of the geological record where there are rocks, and so there is in principle information available to us, there are fewer and fewer rocks the further back we go. And so we're really having to scrabble around to reconstruct the conditions at the surface of the earth, such as its temperature, how much carbon dioxide was the in the atmosphere and things like that. So it would be really convenient if we were able to, to, to time travel and we could just go back to these periods and stick a thermometer out the window of the time machine and measure what the temperature was like and the wind speed and everything else we'd like to know about what was happening on the planet at the time. And so this is where we're gonna kind of make the transition now to, to exoplanets. So we've got these kind of major questions coming out of the solar system. Um, and that they're kind of coming out of our inability to access the whole geological record and our the kind of major uncertainties that we have over the history of Mars and Venus. Um, so the exciting prospect of one exciting prospect of exoplanets is that we can look at planets, at a diversity of planetary ages, and so see planets at different stages of their evolution. And as we've seen for Earth, it's undergone this really dramatic evolution. And so indeed has Mars and possibly Venus as well. And so that kind of leads us to the first poll, which I can see is up now. Um, asking if you could travel back to any point in Earth history, um, when would you go to? Um, so I think that poll will kind of run um, for a little bit and you can put your responses in and then we can have a look at what, what everyone thinks. Um, and so this is just a schematic emphasizing the kind of, kind of transition that Earth will have gone through. So going beyond what we can see from the rock record, but now to the period in time, which is sort of to some extent speculation, the kind of formation epoch, and so on the left, we're looking at Earth as it might have been just after its formation. So extremely hot and possibly entirely molten, um, a so-called magma ocean, as the heat of its formation had rendered the entire planet um, liquid. And on the right, um, we're looking at the planet that we have today. So it's evolved into a planet with plate tectonics and continental crust and liquid water oceans um, that sustains abundant life. Cool, I think the poll is, so the poll is completed and the, the winning, are, there's, I think there's an almost even split between all options um, from any a point in human history um, to before life had emerged. And I think the, in fact, there's a draw between going back to the age of the dinosaurs and before life had emerged. And I'm not sure which one of these I would choose, but I'm kind of glad the human history one didn't win and that one of the geological ones did win. I think I'd like to go back before life emerged because life has kind of contaminated <laughs> all of the, the history of the planet and got in the way of understanding what the planet would have done on its own. Um, cool. That was really interesting. Um, great. So, yeah, so we want, we want to take the opportunity that exoplanets might afford to look at planets in all stages of their life um, and see what that might tell us about planetary evolution. And this is just a graph. This graph is just showing the kind of range of um, ages that planets will have. And some of these ages actually go beyond the likely age of the universe. Um, and that's because of the uncertainty of estimating the age of stars. So what we're really looking at is the age of a star estimated by some means. And we see that there's a huge range of ages of stars around which there are planets. So every star on this, this histogram is a, a star which has a planet around it. Um, and Earth is at four and a half billion years old. Earth and the sun are about four and a half billion years old there. And we see many, many stars are younger. And so we'll be able to look um, back into the, the back into the past, essentially, about of planets before they've had as long to evolve to their current state as Earth has. 
And we'll also be able to look into the future um, to systems that are older than our own um, solar system and possibly see the fate of an Earth-like planet in a billion years or two billion years time, which is really exciting as well. So let's now look at um, some exoplanet results. Um, and this is a really uh, neat video capturing, um, showing some of the kind of essence of the results of, of exoplanetary science. So just to talk through some of what we're seeing, there's these big, there's these kind of dashed lines here. These are showing the orbits of solar system planets. So in the background, you can see these dashed line circles. Each of these is the orbit of a solar system planet, um, starting with, I think, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, um, then after jumping out Jupiter, Saturn, and so on. And everything in this diagram is to kind of to scale. So the fact that the, so the orbits of the solar system planets look enormous compared to these kind of orbits, which we see kind of all over the, the video here, is because the solar system is really kind of um, really expanded, really wide. The orbital separation between planets is really large compared to many of the exoplanets that have been discovered. And so all of these tiny little circles um, are really, in a relative terms, genuinely very compact. So within these tiny little circles, there's the host star of these planets, and the planets themselves are what, what's been drawn on, and they're orbiting around their star in extremely quickly. Um, and so the size of the circles is uh, related to the size of the planet. So you can see many of these circles are very large. They're kind of Neptune or Jupiter-sized planets that have been discovered, and the color is related to how hot they are. And you can see many are bright red, showing that they're maybe over 1200 Kelvin. So they're a temperature which might melt the surface of a, of a rocky planet. Another way, um, ooh, yeah, so the kind of key observation from, from this kind of compilation of exoplanetary discoveries is that we're finding planets which look, or we're finding other planetary systems that look very unlike our own solar system. We're finding giant planets extremely close to the host star. Um, whereas we're used to the planets closest to our star are rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, all small rocky planets. And the giant planets are kind of nicely out the way in the outer bits of the solar system. That's not what we're seeing in any of the, the planetary systems drawn on this in this video here. So we need to think a bit about the observations that have created that population of planets we saw in that video. And so the key, um, the key kind of observational technique that's discovered many planets is the transit method. And what we're looking at in this video here, I'll play it again, is the transit of Venus in, across our own sun. And Whilst the disk of Venus passes across uh, the sun's disk, the light that we receive from the sun is very slightly lessened. Um, we wouldn't notice the passage of Venus in front of the sun in terms of kind of naked eye. Would the, the day wouldn't get darker. But a, a sensitive instrument would notice that you're missing that little bit patch of light um, that's being blocked by Venus as it passes in front of the, the sun. Just play it one more time. So this transit technique is really a powerful method if you have very sensitive instruments for noticing when a, a planet passes between you and the star that you're looking at. Um, so just to look at this kind of schematically, you have a star, a planet's in orbiting or orbit around it, and what you're doing is you're very closely monitoring the amount of light, the so-called flux that you're getting from that star. And as the planet passes between your line of sight and the star, then the amount of light that you're receiving from the star decreases a little bit. This is the transit event. And then the star, the planet moves out of the way around in its orbit um, and you get back to where you started. So that creates a really distinctive signal um, that you can observe if you're monitoring the light from stars. And the depth of the signal um, is related to how big the planet is. So you can kind of intuitively see if, if you make this blue circle bigger, um, you'll make the depth of the transit bigger as more light is blocked. So there's a relationship between the depth of the transit and the size of the planet. That's the RP, the radius of the planet. Um, so we can use this to not only identify that a planet is around another star, but also to identify how big that planet is, its radius. Um, and one of the most successful missions to apply the transit method is the Kepler, Kepler Space Telescope. And it looked, initially, it looked out 3000 light years into the galaxy. So this, this yellow beam here is the kind of the volume of the galaxy it was looking out into, uh, monitoring the brightness of stars and looking for these transient dimming events that occur as a, um, a planet transits across the disk of its host star. 
And it generated many thousands of exoplanetary discoveries. And so a popular way of looking at the exoplanet discoveries is in this diagram of the mass of the planet against how far away the planet is from its host star. Um, so we're looking at distance in terms of astronomical units. So one astronomical unit is the Earth sun distance. So going from close to the star on the left to far away on the right. And then looking at the mass of the planet in terms of Earth masses. So obviously Earth on this diagram is one Earth mass at one AU. Um, and we're going up to more, more and more massive planets. And if we put the solar system planets on here, these black squares, we see immediately that the exoplanet catalogue is full of planets that are really weird compared to what we see in the solar system. So Venus and Earth are down here. Jupiter just about kind of gets near some of the exoplanets. Saturn, Saturn Uranus and Neptune all um, lie away. So from this, these kind of observations, it looks like the solar system is really weird. Um, most exoplanetary systems appear to have very, very much more massive planets than we have in our own solar system. Um, you know, some of these are a thousand times the mass of the Earth. Um, and also that these planets are really close to their host star. So Mercury isn't actually on here, but Mercury's orbit. So the closest planet to our own sun is about 0 0.3, 0 0.4 astronomical units. So somewhere down over here. And so we're seeing like Jupiter mass planets or planets even more massive than Jupiter orbiting closer to their host star than Mercury orbits to our own star. Um, so these are really weird compared to the sort of architecture of our solar system. But it's really important to understand what biases have crept into creating these observations. So is what we've discovered a true representation of what's really there? Or are, or are our observations in some way limited or biased towards seeing these particular types of planetary systems with very massive planets that are very close to their host star. And so we can kind of schematically get, get an idea of the biases that are present just um, with this kind of simple cartoon. So if we imagine we've got a star and a planet around it, and the separation between the star and the planet is called its semi-major axis, it doesn't really matter. And given this kind of setup, we can, we can identify where an observer needs to be in order to have a chance of seeing the transit happen. And the observer needs to be anywhere in this kind of arc here. So if you're, if you're sitting in space somewhere over here, say on Earth, anywhere in this kind of cone and looking towards this star, you would see this planet pass in front of its star. But if you're up here somewhere, you'd look towards the star and you'd never see the planet pass in front of it. So you'd never see a transit. Now, if the planet gets further away, then the region of space that you could be in and still see that planet pass in front of its star gets, a, gets much smaller. So we've gone from all three of these Earths being able to look towards the star and see the transit to now only the one in the very middle being able to look towards the star and see the transit. So what this is saying is that there's a strong bias in favour of us detecting planets that are really close to the host star. And the, there's another big bias, which is we're really, there's a, a bias in favour of detecting massive planets, because like we discussed, a massive planet is going to block more light and so create a bigger dimming of the star. So it's just easier to see when a star dims a lot compared to just a very small change in how bright it is sort of the difference between the transit of Venus and the moon getting in the way of the sun, where we, we would notice the, the day getting darker. So we can use this insight that our observations are kind of biased to convert the observations we have got into an estimate of what really is there in the, in the nearby galaxy in terms of a planet population. And so we're just going to look now at how the, the data transforms when we account for these biases that are present in our observations. So we're going to go back to one of these graphs, looking at the sort of size of a planet versus how far away it is from its star. Um, and now we've just switched to talking about the radius of the planet. Um, so again, in Earth radii, so Earth has one Earth radius, which is about 6,000 kilometers, to planets that are now 10 20 times Earth's radius, and Jupiter's about 10 times Earth, Earth's radius, so it falls somewhere around here, um, against orbital period. And obviously Earth has a 360-day orbit, um, and planets with longer orbital periods are further away from their star. So these red dots are what we discover when we look out um, at, at the night sky, 
and discover exoplanets, we discover planets distributed like this. So we, we find lots of planets that are very massive, 10 times, 20 times the radius of the Earth, and on very short orbits. So they're, the length of their year would be only a few days, between one and 10 days for many of these planets, compared to our 360 day year. Now, if we account for our biases, um, we discover that this population that we see here transforms into a population that looks something like this. So this would be the true population that must underlie what we've actually discovered. And so what this is saying, so what we're seeing is that actually there are many more planets that are small, so have a, a small radius closer to that of Earth's and on longer periods, so have a longer year like Earth's. So what this is telling us is that the biases are, are preference towards discovering very big planets that are very close to their star is so strong that it can transform the observations which are all concentrated in the top left of this diagram to the bottom right. And so what this means is that we've gone from a population of planets that mostly look like gas giants, which are not really geological and not really very obviously habitable either. They're all extremely hot, or well, most of them are extremely hot, and the size of Jupiter or bigger. So maybe there's life, <laughs> possibly, but it seems rather unlikely. Certainly in the very hot planets, it seems very unlikely. Um, and if there was life on the, the sort of Jupiter-type planets, it's going to have to be some truly very alien life that's emerged in the clouds. But what, by accounting for the biases, what we've learned is that actually small planets are the most frequent type of planets in the galaxy. And so this is another way of looking at it now as a kind of histogram. We see that the most, uh, most frequent planets are kind of Earth and super Earth sized planets. Um, and uh, yeah, and so that's these planets that are kind of one to two times the radius of Earth. And so these are also really exciting planets to think about because the super Earth type planets, these planets are a little bit bigger than Earth, but not quite as big as Neptune or Uranus, are a type of planet that we don't have in our own solar system. Um, so we're really excited to discover more about these. Are these planets more like Earth, but just a bigger version? Um, or are they more like small versions of Neptune with a big, thick layer of gas around them? Um, we don't really, we haven't really resolved that question yet. So I think there's a second poll, um, and the good time to ask the second poll would be now. Um, and that's about which planets are you most interested in knowing more about? Um, the solar system planets, um, super Earths, or magma ocean worlds? Um, so those really hot planets that are so hot and so close to their star, they're permanently molten. Um, so they're a bit like maybe how Earth started its life, but they've been trapped in this molten state for their entire history. Cool. So I'll let that poll run and then we can come back to it once the, the answers are all in. So I just wanted to kind of mention one particular planetary system um, now, which is really exciting um, for, for follow up observations. And that's the TRAPPIST-1 system. So this is the kind of this is the data that were that was collected um, in 2017 by this this international group of scientists in 2017. Um, and what we're looking at is the the brightness of the TRAPPIST-1 star. So the star is called TRAPPIST-1. We're looking at its brightness through time. And these de these days are Earth days. Um, so these are kind of 10 or more than 10 days of observations of the TRAPPIST-1 star. Um, and all these little dots are a measurement of how bright the star appears. And so most of the time it's sort of, you know, it's pottering around um, in this kind of black population here. But occasionally there are these big dimming events and where the brightness seems to dim by maybe one or two percent. Um, and each of those dimming events represents the transit of a planet in front of the star. So this is kind of what the data look like. And it turns out that when you look at this, this system, you can see actually the depths of some of these events. They're not all going to the same depth, but any planet, any, any single planet should orbit around sort of completely regularly and produce a transit of exactly the same depth because the planet's the same size. Each time it comes around in front of the star, it's the same size, it blocks out the same amount of light. But we see that these transits have different depths and that the timing between them is not doesn't appear to be regular. And so actually that's telling us there's more than one planet in this system. Um, and that actually there's, there's seven planets in this system. Um, so it's a remarkable system where we say we're seeing seven planets edge on, all of which are transiting between us and the TRAPPIST-1 star. 
Um, oh, okay, so the poll is completed and <laughs> overwhelmingly um, people are most interested in knowing more about super earth. And I think that's gonna be super, super exciting to know whether you can double the size of the earth and you do you still get plate tectonics? Do you still get volcanism? Do you still have a kind of normal-ish size atmosphere or do you inevitably end up with a, a huge, a, a massive atmosphere, a thousand kilometer deep oceans covered by a thick layer of hydrogen? Um, so these are kind of really exciting planets um, to, to learn more about. So I'm excited that that was a popular choice um, and followed up by Magma Ocean Worlds, which are also um, cool because maybe we'll get a glimpse into our own planet's past by studying those, those Magma Ocean planets. Cool. Um, yeah, so the other, the, other exciting, the other exciting thing that we see in the TRAPPIST-1 results are flares. So we can see sometimes the brightness of the star actually increases. Um, and that's because the star has had a big flaring event. Um, so we kind of see both some astrophysical kind of phenomena in terms of the stellar dynamics. And we also seeing all this evidence for the planets, the planetary system. Um, so if we kind of combine all these results together, you see this beautiful evidence. So these are what the individual transits look like. Um, and hopefully you'll see these kind of look a bit like the schematic that I showed earlier on in the talk, where we see the nice constant brightness of the star, then the planet moves in front, we get the dimming and it goes back again. And we can see that the width of the transit, the durate, so the duration over which the dimming occurs, that's increasing as the, the, the planet gets further and further away from the star. So we can order the planets nicely from B, C, D, E, F, G, and H, these kind of terribly boring names that they're given. Um, we can see this is the innermost planet and this is the outermost planet. And the length of the year of these planets ranges from one and a half days, one and a half Earth days, all the way out to 14 to 25 days. So again, this is kind of telling us we're looking at an extremely compact system where all of these seven planets are really packed in super close to the star. And another way of looking at this is, is kind of top down onto this planetary system. Um, and we see that the, the orbital separation in terms of astronomical units, again, is at most about 0.06 AAU. So that's 6% of the Earth-Sun distance. Um, so extremely close to the host star. So the kind of key question, ooh, well, another way of looking at this actually, um, and this is a really beautiful schematic um, put together by Amanda Smith at the IOA in, in Cambridge, is showing the, the TRAPPIST-1 system compared to um, the, so the inner solar system planets, so Earth, Venus, Mercury. And so we have to go all the way well inside the orbit of Mercury um, before we see the first trap, the outermost TRAPPIST-1 planet um, of TRAPPIST-1H, and then the rest are even closer. So the kind of key question we'd have for ourselves, this is an enormously exciting planetary system, these seven planets. Um, the question we'd immediately have is, are they all gonna be just burnt to a crisp? Because that's exactly what they would be in our own solar system if they're orbiting our star. Um, Venus has a surface temperature of over 400 degrees, partly yeah, in large part because it has, has a massive atmosphere of carbon dioxide, but Mercury also has extremely high surface temperatures and these planets are even closer still. Um, but the key difference between our solar system and the, the TRAPPIST-1 system is the size of the star. Um, so our sun is a G-type star, whereas the TRAPPIST-1 star is an M dwarf. Um, so it's only maybe 10% the mass of the sun and is much less bright as a result. So it's this kind of cool, faint red um, dwarf star. And that means that although these planets are much closer, um, and this is a, a nice kind of um, artist's impression of the TRAPPIST-1 system orbiting around um, their, their kind of reddish M dwarf on the left. Even though they're much closer than the solar system planets, they aren't all necessarily going to be extremely hot. And in fact, if you kind of estimate um, roughly which planets might be able to keep liquid water at their surface, you think there may be planets D and E, um, possibly F, maybe C could have liquid water present at the surface. So, and all because the, the star is so dim, so it's not heating the planets up as much. Um, so it's an extremely exciting system um, to study more over the next decade, and it will receive a lot of telescope attention um, as new, new facilities become available to observe these planets, um, to investigate whether or not they do have liquid water, they have atmospheres, and whether or not there's signs of life on them. 
Um, and a, a key additional piece of information we already have in studying these planets is, is that we're able to go beyond just the size of the planet, the radius, but to look at actually their mass. And the way in which the masses of planets are, are determined in um, exoplanetary science, or one of the main methods is using uh, the radial velocity technique. Um, and that's just shown in this video here by the fact that a planet and a star, when you have a planet with a star, the star will actually kind of wobble around a bit as a result of the mass of the planet in the system. And you can measure that wobbling by making very precise observations of the spectra of the star. And that's just shown kind of schematically here um, in this kind of rainbow at the bottom here. We can see the rainbow moving left and right as the, the star gets pulled around by the planet. And that allows us to estimate the mass of the planet. And if we know the planet's mass and its radius, then we can estimate its density. And its density is the sort of most basic insight that we will have into the structure of the planet. For example, whether it's made up mostly of gas and water, which is all very low density, whether it's primarily made of rock, which is sort of intermediate density, or whether it's really rich in iron, like mercury in the solar system with a giant core of iron, in which case it'd be very high density. And so that's what we're looking at in this diagram here. These are estimates of the density of the TRAPPIST-1 planets. Um, we can put on some solar system planets for reference. So Earth, um, so most rocky planets in the solar system have densities of around five um, grams per centimeter cubed. And you can see the TRAPPIST planets, which are the red circles here, certainly C and E have densities very close to that of Earth and Venus. So it's consistent with a planet which is dominated by rock, which indeed Earth is, and opens the possibility then for there being kind of a small mass of liquid water. So maybe enough that there would still be sort of like land exposed. Um, and that opens the possibility for, for climate um, processes that regulate planetary climate to occur and um, indeed prospects for, for life. Um, we can also see some of the Trappist planets are much lower density, and that maybe suggests that they have a thick envelope of water or hydrogen or some low density gas around them. So coming to the end now, but I just wanna end briefly on prospects for actually detecting life. Like what might we actually do to discover um, if life is on one of these planets? So going beyond speculating about the habitability of the planet and whether it has liquid water, um, to think about what can we actually see to tell us whether life is there. So Earth, again, is a, is a useful um, guide as to what um, a biosignature might look like, a sign of life. So this is, a, this is a reflected light spectrum of the Earth. And so this is short wavelengths off to the left. So that would be kind of blue colours and kind of red colours off to the right, so longer wavelengths. And we see we get lots more scattered light from Earth at short wavelengths. And what that means is Earth looks blue. We see a lot of blue light being kind of scattered back towards us. And that's really characteristic of Earth, because if we look at the Moon, Mars and Venus, their reflectance spectra all do the exact opposite. We see less and less blue light coming from those planets and more red light. And so Mars and Venus indeed look kind of reddy orange in their reflectance spectra. And the reason Earth has this, this characteristic, Earth has this colour, is because of um, is because of life, is because life has put um, oxygen and ozone into the atmosphere, uh, which, which has created the scattering characteristics um, that we observe. Um, so I think there's, there's one more poll actually, um, which but now would be a good time to ask it, which is um, where will we discover life in the galaxy? Um, so do, we think, do people think we're gonna discover life on Mars? Um, in the clouds of Venus, or, of which there's been a lot of discussion recently, um, or in some kind of crazy exoplanet, or maybe people, everyone's pessimistic and we won't find alien life anywhere, which would be interesting in, in and of itself, um, exactly how special um, we are. So that kind of reflectance spectra technique is one way that we're going to be able to just look for signs of life. And the other is by looking at how the light of the, the star of a planet interacts with its atmosphere. And some light gets scattered out and then some light gets absorbed by molecules in the planet's atmosphere. And that can allow us to kind of fingerprint um, uh, molecular species in the atmosphere like oxygen as well. So what I wanna do now is come back to the, the question we posed, well, the prospect we posed at the beginning of this um, talk 
which was that uh, hydrology degrees just got 52 billion times more useful. So we can we can kind of actually substantiate that claim now by doing some simple maths. So the Milky Way has 250,000 million stars. Um, we know from our study of, of exoplanets that rocky planets are, are common. And so maybe 20% of um, stars have a rocky planet. Um, and that immediately tells us that we've got many tens of billions of, of rocky planets in the galaxy. Um, so that's exciting from the perspective of, of a geologist who's spent their career studying rocky planets. Um, it's no longer just Earth, uh, maybe Venus and Mars that we can think about, but in fact, the whole galaxy is teeming with geological worlds. We can be a bit more kind of um, tough on ourselves, though. We can say, well, maybe we're only interested in studying rocky planets around stars that are a lot like the sun, in which case we've only got 15 billion stars to, to play with. Um, and we can be even meaner still and say we're, we're not happy with any old rocky planet. We specifically want a rocky planet which is you know, habitable, which might have liquid water at its surface. Um, and so that might be a, a, about 30 percent of sun like stars. So in which case we've got only four and a half billion planets to, to study that might be Earth like and that are a truly um, kind of Earth like geological worlds. Still, um, the geology degrees got that a little bit more useful. So I just want to end with this really beautiful image, which is very famous, which is the pale blue, blue dot image taken by Voyager spacecraft um, on its way out of the solar system, looking back towards Earth. And just emphasize that the key kind of principle that we've explored here is using Earth as a kind of model rocky planet and thinking about the processes on Earth as a kind of a key to understanding um, planetary habitability um, in planets across the galaxy. Um, and that's both going to help us in, in studying exoplanets, but is also hopefully going to tell us something about Earth's own history when we're able to explore planets doing things that Earth did in its distant past, which we have very little information on now. Uh, and just to close with the, the results of the last poll, um, so people overwhelmingly, well, there was this kind of a split. I think the preference was we're going to find life on an Earth-like exoplanet or on a water world. Um, and either one would be really fascinating. In a way, I kind of really hope we find a, a life on a water world, which I think was the winner in the poll, um, because that would say that that would tell us something kind of quite profound about what life needs or doesn't need to get started. I, it doesn't need um, surface land, um, which many people would think currently that it probably does. Um, and prospects aren't looking good for Mars based upon this poll. Um, so no, we better not tell NASA that. Cool, but thank you very much. That's where I'll end the, the talk today. And take any questions. Hi, Ollie. Thanks so much. What a fascinating talk. Um, yeah, I had no idea that that's the systems beyond our solar system could look so different or how we would be so about them. Um, observing or understanding them so that's really really interesting uh, we have a lot of questions everybody's very keen on the topics of your talk and um, i'm going to take a quick i'm going to ask a quick question as chair's prerogative which is how did the trappist system get named <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I> think, <laughs> do you know yeah i'm, I'm probably not going to do 100 percent justice to the the name the origin story but it's a it was a belgian scientific team um and i think think they just really like Trappist beer. Yeah, <laughs> so fair enough. That. <laughs> it's an excellent name. Yeah. <laughs> I like it a lot. I think um, if you discover it, you I guess you've got the you've got the privilege to Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. geologist privilege as well. Yeah. Um Great. So uh, just to everyone who's still here, if you do have any questions that you haven't put through yet, just pop them in the Q&A box on Zoom or into uh, YouTube. We have quite a few already. So quite a lot of people asking about the Trappist system. So since the planets around the Trappist system are so close, would that make their orbits irregular? And kind of linked to that, um, are these planetary systems unstable because there are so many planets so close together compared to our own? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So it turns out that the, the system is peculiarly stable. Um, so okay. the planets all, they're in this kind of arrangement where they're, they're kind of resonant. Um, so the orbit of one planet, so one planet, the, an inner planet orbits, and then in the time it takes that planet to orbit twice, the outer planet maybe does a whole orbit. So there's these okay. kind of integer 
kind of relationships between the orbital periods of all the Trappist planets. Um, so it's in this kind of so-called multi-resonant chain, which is like a really kind of fragile and remarkable thing for the system to have kind of put itself into, where they're, they're all doing this extremely regular dance. Um, and actually most exoplanetary systems have fallen out of resonance. Um, so if you look at the architecture of lots and lots of planetary systems, you see that there's kind of there's lots of planets that are just outside this very neat relationship where it, you know there's one orbit for two orbits kind of thing and okay. so something's happened to destabilize them but the trappist one has stayed like in this beautiful stable state for its entire history which will be billions of years um so actually if anything it's a really stable system and they what they do do is they interact kind of tidally so a bit like, you know, Earth's, Earth and the moon tidally interact and the moon pulls our oceans around. And the other example of tidal interaction in the solar system, which is really remarkable, is Io, Jupiter's moon Io, mm. it's like super volcanic and is having all and it's heated up constantly by by all the kind of stretching that it experiences by tidal interactions between Jupiter and the other moons. So that kind of same thing's happening probably in the, the Trappist system, which might mean the inner planet or the inner couple of planets experience really strong tides. Um, yeah. that's fascinating um, yeah there's some stuff about Io and its volcanism in the virtual exhibition actually for people who want to have a look at that um, and interesting that the Trappist system is so stable given it's named potentially after a beer but yeah I like that yeah. um, <laughs> yeah. um, a couple of other questions about the Trappist system uh, somebody asked if they were tidally locked which you just explained how far away is the Trappist system I think somebody asked if it was in our solar system it's beyond our solar system but how far away is it do we know yeah, so those di they, lots of those diagrams are a bit deceptive because they keep putting the Trappist system in our solar system to emphasize, look, it's really compact and tiny. We could kind of fit it inside our solar system. Mm. But it's, um, I think it's about 30, 40 light years away. So it's extremely okay. close. It's extremely close compared to many, many of the other planetary systems that have been discovered. And that's really important. But because it's so close, we're able to make really good observations of it with the telescopes. Um, whereas many of the planetary systems that had been discovered previously by the Kepler mission, and it was looking out in, in this kind of volume of the galaxy up to 3000 light years away, it was looking at stars that are so far away, it's really hard to do anything more with the observation. Um, okay. So, yeah, so this is a system that's really optimal for kind of mm. follow up and future investigation. Okay. Um, somebody asks, have we discovered mostly systems with gas giants close to their star purely due to our limited observation techniques? You mentioned that there's some kind of bias in the data about what we can and can't observe. Is that one of the reasons why we observe mostly gas giants? Yeah, yeah, we're much better at discovering them. So actually, the, those, those giant planets on really short period orbits are very rare actually so knowing how how good we are at discovering them it's not surprising we discover loads of them but actually only yeah. maybe one or two percent of stars have in reality if we could really go to the systems only one or two percent of them have those giant planets on really short period orbits um yeah okay um and somebody else on zoom asks Earth's geology, as we know, is quite different from that of its immediate planetary neighbours. Is this sort of difference between planets similar in other systems or are other systems much more, the planets much more like each other? <laughs> I think that's something we'd really love to know. We'd really love to do comparative planetology in exoplanetary systems to discover, because yeah. we, what we really want to understand is what matters, right? Like what, you know, Earth is really different to Mars, it's really different to Venus. But what was it that made them that different? Is it, is it really, does everything really come down to just being closer to or further away from the sun? Because that's one obvious difference. Or is it all about, you know, when you're, when a planet is as small as Mars is, is Mars is, then it's unable to, you know, retain an atmosphere and it gets cold really quickly. Um, so we can kind of speculate on those parameters in the solar system, but it would be, really exciting to use exoplanets where there's you know, many many more of them and observations to tell us what what really matters for setting planetary habitability so it's kind of like a two-way conversation we can kind of use the solar system to inform our best guess mm. test it against observations of exoplanets and then make a better guess is kind okay. of how we want to operate so the geology at home and what we see around us is always important regardless of how far away the thing that we're looking at is 
That's really yeah. fascinating. Um, yeah, we had a couple of kind of technological questions. Uh, so someone on YouTube asks, is one of the objectives of the James Space James Webb Space Telescope to look for exoplanets and atmospheric signals off them in particular? Yeah, so the James Webb is, I think, every bit of the astronomy community wants to use the James Webb. Um, <laughs> so one of many, many um, tasks is to look at exoplanet atmospheres. Um, and so it won't be discovering exoplanets. So the, the time on the telescope is, is way too precious to risk not seeing, not seeing something. So okay. the James Webb telescope is going to be used to look at known exoplanets, like, for example, the TRAPPIST system, and make hopefully make atmospheric observations of, of those known systems. Um, and yeah, so that's that's super exciting. And a lot of work is being done to, to yeah, figure out which planets to look at, what we should expect to see, um, and all that kind of stuff. Great. Okay. And Jessica Barton asks, what technological advances would most help us to study or observe or understand exoplanets better? Um, yeah, so I think I'm not 100% qualified to answer that well, because I'm not an astronomer. I'm not an observational <laughs> astronomer by training. But I, I think the, I think the sort of superficial answer is is bigger telescopes in space, which is kind of a bit of a rub, rubbish answer. <laughs> but I think what what would be really fantastic, certainly for like truly Earth like planets, is you know the problem you have with an Earth like planet is if you want the planet to pass in front of the star, well, a true Earth is only going to do that once every year, and so that that means you have to wait a long time for the event and then you get a brief window of the thing happening and then it's gone again so really you want to be able to just look directly at the planet rather than have to wait for it to pass in front of the star and if you want to look directly at the planet then you've got the problem that the star is so bright that you look towards the system and all you see is the light from the star so the kind of the the discussions around technology that would make it possible to look at an earth-like planet I think largely comes down to having the technology to block out the light from the star and then spatially resolve the small planet at kind of one astronomical unit that is an Earth and then be able to look Mm. directly at the photons coming from that planet. Um, So that leads to discussions of coronagraphs and lots of things I don't I don't know about (laughs) Um, the the tricks for getting rid of the star and leaving you just with the the view of the Mm. planet. And that has been straightforward. Yeah, that's been successfully applied for giant planets that are really far away from their host star and are really bright. So they're very easy to see. Well, very easy. That's not true at all. It's possible to separate them from their star. Um, But for small planets that are cold and dim and closer to their host star like Earth, then that hasn't been achieved yet. Yeah. God, it's tricky, isn't it? I mean, we are trying to do things that are very a long way, way away, but it's still. Um, okay, so we had a question about the really, the really cool video that you showed actually in the middle of your talk. Someone asks, um, are the stars that you show in that video very different from our own sun, or are they assumed to be similar? Or yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so yeah, lots of those stars, yeah, there'll be like, kind of a whole range of stars in that catalogue. I think the types so the types of stars people are getting excited about using to study exoplanets are the very small stars like the Trappist one star, the M dwarfs, and the reason for that is that the star is not very bright, so that when you see a planet, you're sort of seeing more signal from the planet and less signal from the star. So the planet basically is kind of a bigger part of what you're seeing when the star is smaller. Um, so. But the the Kepler observations were looking far away into the galaxy. And then you've got a bias towards brighter stars, which typically will be more, which will be a more massive star in general. Um, The the stars that I think are typically underrepresented in terms of planet discoveries are like the the really massive stars, like A-type stars. Um, And that's for the same reason that a small star is a good, has good prospects for discovering a planet. Um, because the planet creates a big signal on the giant stars the planet makes a very small signal because the star itself is so bright and the planet is so small in relative terms so i guess we know rather less about um, planetary systems around those giant type stars 
So there are, again, they're kind of observational factors that come into play to restrict, depending on the type of survey that's been carried out, to like restrict the type of stars that we'll actually be seeing in our, our catalog. Um, but there's nothing, yeah, there's nothing kind of wild about the stars. Okay. The things we recognise. Okay, great. Um, we have, well, I'm just going to give you one, it's six o'clock now, so I'm just going to give you one final question, not least because for UK viewers, the Prime Minister is about to do a press conference. Um, but uh, <laughs> the final question uh, is from Suman Chowdhury, uh, asking you one of your poll questions. Where do you think life is most likely to be detected first away from the Earth, from your list? Ah. <laughs> uh, I think I think if we I think the, the first place we maybe we'll all agree on having discovered life will be Mars if there's life to discover or ever has been mm. life to discover there I think our best prospect for as a community agreeing that there's life on the planet is Mars I think we might well in the next decade or maybe even sooner see a, an atmospheric signature that is suggestive of possibly the production by life. But I suspect what we'll do is then argue vehemently about whether that really is a result of life or not. And it'll be rather hard to resolve that argument probably. Um, so, yeah. Great. Well, that's it. Well, I mean, the arguments are important to have too. Um, <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to say, Ollie, that the uh, the feedback on the chat and the Q&A has been amazing. Everybody very, very grateful saying it's a fascinating talk. Uh, lots and lots of um, compliments about your jumper as well. So well chosen <laughs> for the talk. Uh, thank you so much for such a fascinating talk and for closing out our um, excellent uh, series about the, uh, for the year of space, looking at the geology of other planets. For everyone that's still here, if you've missed any of the talks that we've had this year, we've We've done one for each rocky planet throughout the solar system and a couple of non-rocky ones as well. Uh, you can find them all on the Geological Society's YouTube channel. Please do go and have a look at the virtual tour of our Spacecapes exhibition. Um, and also you can just tour through the information and the images on our web mini website that's in the chat box. Um, and do go to our Year of Space webpage to have a look through anything else that we've been doing this year. We've got fabulous posters, school workshop um, activities, all sorts. Uh, and thank you all for being engaged in our Year of Space and our lecture series. Um, it's been a fantastic year. We've had some incredible planetary geologists to come and talk to us and talk more about their work. So a big thank you to all of them. And uh, we hope that we, you continue to enjoy all of the activities and resources that we've made available. Uh, thank you very much for attending and uh, I hope you have a lovely evening um, not getting too cold, especially for those people in the UK. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye. Goodbye. Okay,